Hi, and welcome back. I'm going to talk about the lost art of looping today. And I don't mean drum loops. In a change from the usual program, I'm using Soundforge instead of Reaper. I work in Reaper about 90% of the time these days. But I was in fact a Soundforge user long before Reaper even existed. If you're wondering about the difference between an audio editor like Soundforge and a DAW like Reaper, I'll try to sum it up for you. Let's drag in a sample. Trim the start and fade out the end. If I now hit Control S to save, those changes are written back to the file destructively. And the next time I load that sample, it'll be neatly trimmed as so. Let's try the same thing in Reaper. I can drag the sample into the Arrange page in much the same way. Trimming the start and fading the end is easy. Now let's hit Control S, and I'm invited to save the project. If I want to write this data to a WAV file, I'll have to render, and I'll have to render to a new file. Trying to overwrite the original will pop up an error warning that the file is in use. While the feature set of an audio editor does indeed overlap with that of a DAW, this fundamental difference in workflow cascades down through the whole application and makes them suited for very different scenarios. A DAW is perfect for creating a song, but if you're creating a sample library, an editor might be more useful. I'll illustrate this by dragging in another sample, this time an acoustic guitar harmonic. And notice that the sample just stops dead after little more than a second. Why would a sample like this be trimmed so short with no fade out? Surely it makes it useless. If we peek at the file properties, there's a clue as to the reason. Yes, that's right, I created this sample way back in 2001. And it was destined for my hardware sampler. Which in fact I still own, though I can't remember when I last used it. Although I pimped mine with extra RAM and even an internal hard drive, the Yamaha A3000 maxed out at 128 megabytes and couldn't stream samples directly from the hard drive. So large, sprawling sample libraries of the type we're used to today were simply not possible. In those days, large samples were a luxury most could not afford. Even if you'd maxed out your sampler with RAM, you probably wouldn't want to fill that up with a single patch. Most people couldn't afford a rack full of samplers, so hardware samplers were usually used multi-timbrally to provide multiple parts. All the samples for all the patches used would need to total less than 128 meg in that case. And that's assuming you upgraded the basic specs of the sampler. Many people had to work with much less. If we take a look at the bar above the waveform display in Soundforge, we can see that I've defined a sustaining loop. If I press the special play as sample button at the bottom, the sample plays from the start as normal, but then loops round the sustaining loop until I press stop. This allows your sampler to create long notes from a short sample. A full featured sampler would usually provide a few different options. You could set it to loop around this region as long as the note is held down, but then play to the end when the note is released, which could be useful if there's a distinctive note off behavior that you need to preserve. Or you could set it to loop for the sustain stage and continue to loop during the release, in which case the sample would never play beyond the end of the loop and you could safely trim off the end, as I've done here. However, creating these loop regions was not always easy. I can drag the start and end of the loop region around, and I can zoom in to see the waveform better as I do it. But finding good, clean loop points that don't click or pop or sound obviously cyclic can be really difficult. More a matter of luck than anything else. And if you think this is tricky, try doing it on a hardware sampler with no proper waveform display. This is where Soundforge's loop tuner is invaluable. You can open this from the view menu, but if you're creating a whole sample library, you might want to memorize the hotkey. Now we're seeing the end of the loop section in the left half of the display, and the start of the loop section in the right half of the display. And in the middle, we can see exactly what will happen to the waveform as it loops round from the end back to the start. The buttons at the bottom allow you to play the region before the loop, or the region after the loop if there is one but the middle button loops the sustain region indefinitely. And I can now adjust the start and end points while hearing the result in real time. 
These two buttons shift the loop endpoint back or forward to the next or previous zero crossings, while these two shift the loop start point to the next or previous zero crossings. And I can quickly and easily dial out the discontinuity and create a smooth transition. That's not to say that it's always easy, even with a loop tuner. Some samples are difficult or impossible to loop cleanly, as they don't settle down into a nice simple waveform like this one. In tricky cases where you can't dial out the clicks or pops, you may be able to rescue it by crossfading between the loop start and end. But this isn't always a solution. Complex waveforms that evolve over time, like a cymbal crash or a piano note, can be very difficult to loop well. But you're still about a hundred times more likely to pull it off in SoundForge than on a hardware sampler. Speaking of hardware samplers, back in the day I could save the resulting samples onto a floppy disk, then transfer that disk to the sampler. But much slicker and cooler to just transfer it over directly using the sampler feature. Believe it or not, it was actually possible to transfer samples via old school 5 pin DIN MIDI cables. But this was pretty slow. So I did at one point have a SCSI card in my machine, and I could fire results across the SCSI bus instead, which was an order of magnitude faster. These days, of course, it's much easier. Just drag the samples into modern software such as UVI Falcon, and enjoy the convenient features to help you configure them and map them across the keyboard in about a tenth of the time required on an old school hardware sampler. Of course, these days we measure the RAM available in gigabytes instead of megabytes. And we can stream our samples from lightning fast SSD drives if they're too big even for that. So this kind of tight sample editing has fallen out of fashion. Why spend all that time carefully looping samples when you can just preserve the entire note instead? Especially if the large size of the library is also useful for marketing. Of course, there's no doubt that if your goal is to recreate the sound of an acoustic instrument as accurately as possible, the best approach is to keep as much of the original sample as possible and preserve the natural decay of each note. But this is not always the goal when creating samples. In this case, I wasn't trying to emulate a real guitarist playing harmonics. I wanted to create an unusual new instrument instead. Tight, short, looped samples can actually have a few advantages in this case. The sustain and release of each note can be defined solely by the envelopes used in the patch, with no natural burnt-in decay characteristics to complicate the issue. Each note can be much more consistent in its decay, with no tendency for some notes to decay faster than others. And notes can sustain or release for as long as you like, regardless of the original length of the sample. As a bonus, it makes it easier to record samples. Even in a really nice studio, it can be difficult to avoid background noise creeping in during the decay of each note. Even a subtle rustle of clothing can become a problem if it happens every time you play a certain note. Short samples with a sustain loop are much less likely to suffer from these kinds of issues. And finally, small samples are still more efficient. While it may not be the deal breaker it used to be, small samples will load quicker and leave you more of your resources free for other parts. In this case, I've created an instrument that's playable over a surprisingly wide keyboard range, using only seven samples with a total file size of about one megabyte. So let's not allow this technique to be lost in the mists of time. Just because we have the freedom to create multi-gigabyte libraries these days, that doesn't mean there isn't still value in tightly edited and carefully looped samples, especially when loaded into software like Falcon, which is about a thousand times more powerful than my old hardware. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.